Hi, and welcome to this third of the three-part video series on the 123 Block Project. And in this third video, we're going to be looking at grinding and finishing, which are one and the same operation. There are two main reasons for grinding. The first is hardness, when the part is just too hard to be cut with traditional cutting tools. And the second is precision, because some parts require a high degree of precision that traditional cutting tools just can't give us. It's important to know that grinding wheels don't rub material off. Grinding wheels are cutting tools. They are made up of thousands upon thousands of very small ceramic grains that are each very sharp. Each one of those grains acts as a cutting tool and will lift a chip. Since each one of those ceramic grains is very heat resistant, well, we can cut at a very high temperature and thusly remove minute chips, even on very hard materials. Now, since we can remove very minute amounts of material, well, we can cut very, very accurately. If I can form a chip that's only two ten thousandths of an inch thick, well, I can take a cut that's only two ten thousandths of an inch thick, and I can do it accurately. Now, the part that I want to cut for this project is around 45 to 48 Rockwell C. That's pretty hard to cut with traditional tooling. So we're going to be using a medium grit aluminum oxide grinding wheel. And that should give us the surface finish that we want and the accuracy that we want, even if the part is very hard. So let's get over to the surface grinder and get on with this project. We start by cleaning up one of the primary surfaces using an old broken grinding wheel or similar coarse abrasive. What we want to do here is remove all of the scale that has formed on the surface during the heat treatment. The objective here isn't to get the surface perfectly clean, but really just to remove all that scale. Since we want the surface that we identified with the number punches to be our reference surface, so the first one to be ground, we're going to clean up the surface that has the counter bores. We can then move on to our roughing lapping plate and using a medium sized abrasive grit, get the surface nice and flat. Notice that I'm using a figure eight movement as much as possible and that I'm also trying to use as much of the lapping plate surface as possible. Remember, all we have to do here is clean up the primary surface that has the counter bores. Don't waste your time cleaning the other ones because all we need here is one good surface to sit up against the surface grinder's magnetic table because our first grinding operation will be on the primary surface that has our numbers punched onto it and that will become the reference surface for all the rest of the block. With everything really clean, that means the part and the surface plate, we can move on to verifying the flatness of the surface that we've just cleaned up. While applying a good pressure on the center of the block, tap the four corners. If three of the four corners don't produce any sound, you can likely burnish the part and visually see if you have a good spread on your contact points. And now using a single point diamond dressing tool, I can start to prepare my grinding wheel. The 15 degrees inclined diamond dresser should be installed about half an inch off center in the direction of rotation of the grinding wheel. Make certain that the table's longitudinal axis is locked and that the magnetic table is activated. You can then lower the grinding wheel so that it just brushes up against the diamond dresser. And now using the transverse axis, you can take a cut along the face of the grinding wheel. Take as many cuts as required to true up the wheel, but be careful, very small cuts. One hundredth of a millimeter or a couple of thousandths of an inch at a time, max. Also avoid feeding too slowly. You want your grinding wheel to have some bite to it. Once the dressing is complete, we can turn off the machine activate the emergency stop button and wait, wait, 
wait. We always wait for the grinding wheel to stop turning completely before we disactivate the magnetic table and remove the tool. Your hand should never come close to a turning grinding wheel. Never, never, never. Now you may find that I'm going a little quickly with all this dressing and truing up stuff with the grinding wheels. Well, I am. And that's because the next video that I'm going to be putting out has to do with exactly that subject. We're going to be looking at grinding wheels, dressing, truing, installing, balancing, and whatnot. Even a little bit of how grinding wheels cut. So look for that in the next video. Now let's get back to our project. I can't stress enough how important cleanliness is for grinding, so make certain everything is really clean. Now we can install our part with our counterboard primary surface, the one we prepared, on the magnetic table, and its secondary surfaces inclined to about 30 degrees comparatively to the longitudinal axis of the machine. We can now turn on the grinding machine and slowly bring the grinding wheel close to the surface of the part that we want to grind. Make sure that the part is moving longitudinally to ensure that you touch the lowest part of the grinding wheel. Once that I've just barely touched the part, I'll set the graduated collar on my depth axis to zero, and that'll be where I'll start counting. Since I don't know if I've touched the part on its lowest or highest surface, I'm going to complete this first pass without any additional depth of cut. I have at best only about 0.2 millimeters to take off of this first surface and that's not very much. Note, and this is important, that if you want your grinding wheel to survive long enough to make it to the other edge of the part, you want a rapid longitudinal feed and a very slow cross feed. A slow cross feed reduces the width of each pass and that will extend the dressed life of your grinding wheel. It's also important that the dressing wheel exits the surface of the part at each end of a pass. When the cut is complete, we can return to the back of the part without passing over the surface we've just ground. We don't want to produce marks. If your surface hasn't cleaned up because this pass was very light, well you can take a second pass, but be careful. Two thousandths of an inch in depth maximum. Yes, you heard correctly, I said two thousandths of an inch maximum. The problem here is that this project is in metric. Now the block measured at the start 25.4 millimeters, and we want it to finish at exactly 25. That means that we have 0.4 millimeters overall to take off. That means that on each side we have 0.2 millimeters to remove. 0.2 millimeters in Imperial is 7.8 thousandths of an inch. So almost 8 thousandths of an inch. So for this first surface, I suggest three passes of 2 thousandths of an inch of depth and one final finishing pass of 1 thousandths of an inch in depth. Once this surface is complete, we can move on to our first really, really accurate measurement with a 0.25 millimeter micrometer. I know I'm being a pain, but it's important to remind you to wait for the rotation of the grinding wheel to stop completely before removing the part. So now that we know exactly what's left to be taken off, we can clean everything up and reinstall the part on the magnetic table with our reference surface pointing downwards this time. So we're going to start the second primary surface. Remember, we're already at depth and if we haven't changed the height of the grinding wheel, we can just carry on from there, removing two thousandths of an inch per pass until I reach the required thickness, in this case 25 millimeters. You may want to re-measure once or twice just to make certain that you hit that dimension bang on. Once your cuts are complete, you can turn off the machine, activate the emergency stop button and wait. Wait for the grinding wheel to stop turning. I know I'm being a pain, but it is very important that your fingers never approach a rotating grinding wheel. We can now remove the part from the machine and using a smooth but hard stone deburr the edges that we've just produced. One last verification to make sure that everything's copacetic. 
and everything looks good here so we can move on to our secondary and tertiary reference surfaces using a parallel an angle plate and the two counterboard holes in the surface of my part we're going to fix the part to the angle plate using two m10 by 1.5 socket head cap screws all that the primary surfaces that i've just ground had to be was parallel to themselves however our secondary and tertiary reference surfaces are a little more complicated than that. Our secondary surfaces have to be parallel to themselves, but they also have to be square to the primary surfaces. And our tertiary surfaces have to be parallel to themselves, square to the secondary surfaces and square to the primary surfaces. And that means that we can't just deposit these surfaces on the magnetic table and expect everything to come out square. To get everything square, we're going to have to fix our part to a good square angle plate. And it's the squareness of the angle plate that's going to guarantee that my part will end up square and parallel. It is very important when you install the block on the angle plate that the secondary and tertiary surfaces project beyond the edges of the angle plate. Positioning the part on the angle plate in this way gives us access to the secondary and the tertiary surfaces and we'll be able to grind them without removing them from the angle plate and that will give us a block that is as square as the angle plate is square. After having ground both our primary surfaces, it's safe to say that the grinding wheel probably needs to be dressed again. Remember, one thousandth of an inch per pass you're going to want to remove about four or five thousandths of an inch or if you prefer about two thousandths of an inch more than the deepest cut that you took while grinding your surfaces there now i can disactivate the magnetic table and remove my diamond dresser Cleanliness is crucial for accurate grinding, so once everything's cleaned up, I can install my angle plate and block assembly so that my secondary reference surface is pointing upwards towards my grinding wheel. And using my vernier caliper, I can measure the height of the block in this secondary plane. I can see here that my block measures 50.8 millimeters, so I have 0.4 millimeters to remove on each side of this block, because what I'm shooting for here is a very accurate 50 millimeters. So I'm going to redo the same series of operations as I did when we started to grind my primary surfaces, with one big difference, and that is once that this first or reference secondary surface is complete I'm not going to flip the block over to do the other one right away I'm going to rather move on to my first tertiary surface so I won't go through all the explanations again but I will say we have to take small cuts to remove that 0.4 millimeters and since our machine is imperial that means about 15 thousandths of an inch so six or seven passes should do it Remember, patience is a virtue, and here for safety it's important. So once everything has stopped turning, I can remove my angle plate, clean everything up, and reinstall it so that my tertiary surface is pointing upwards towards my grinding wheel. I can now redo all the steps that I went through to obtain my secondary reference surface, but this time we're going to be doing it for our tertiary surface. The main difference being that we're shooting for 75 millimeters here. Remember, that's 75 millimeters after both surfaces have been ground, so just take half off of this first surface. If we want our holes to be in the proper position, it's very important to remember which surfaces were my reference surfaces. In my case, the two surfaces closest to my identification number are my reference surfaces, and I'll remember that for the rest of the project. A part that is higher than it is wide will not hold properly on a magnetic chuck and needs to be supported. You have to use very accurately squared blocks for this, and if possible, blocks that are just a little shorter than the height of the surface that you want to grind. 
All I want to do here is clean up the second secondary surface, get it nice and flat and parallel so that I can perform an accurate measurement and determine exactly how much material needs to be taken off to get that very accurate 50 millimeter dimension. Remember, you don't want to flip flop your block. Your reference surface is always going to be the one against the magnet from here on in. All the material that you need to remove from these secondary surfaces will be removed from your second secondary surface or if you prefer, the one that we've just cleaned up. My secondary surfaces are complete. I can now identify my tertiary reference surface and position it against the magnetic table. This part is definitely going to require some support. Again, all I want to do here is clean up the second tertiary surface. All I need is a nice flat surface that I can measure from accurately to determine how much material needs to be removed to obtain that accurate 75 millimeter dimension. Everything's nice and flat and square so we can now use our micrometer to perform an accurate measurement and determine exactly how much we need to remove. We can then remove that material gradually, remember two thousandths of an inch maximum per pass, until we get that accurate 75 millimeters. Okay, the machining on this block is complete, but don't forget the deburring. We want to deburr the part because after all we want it to be safe and we want it to look good. So deburr each time you cut and move the part. And there you go. Three pairs of accurate parallel and square surfaces. So there you go. Another project complete. I hope you had fun watching. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video that's going to be all about grinding wheels. So. See you then, and happy machining.